Please welcome Sarah Ripley. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, wow, I, I'm just I'm taken aback by how brave you are and how clear sighted you are um, on the importance, I guess it is, to free yourself from um, this family secret. You were six years old um, when you heard what you describe as that loud sound, that clapping brick sound. How old were you when you realized what had happened with you in the home? So I really didn't understand what happened until much later. Um, I knew obviously that my mom um, was no longer here, but I didn't understand the extent of it. And um, I just remember the day that it happened afterwards, uh, my dad's dad, my pop-up was there and he said, I'll tell you what's going on in the car. And when we got in the car, he just said, your mom's in heaven now. And I never process it beyond that. Um, I, I just, I was so close with my mom that it was too hard. So I really kept everything suppressed. And it wasn't until I was, I guess about like 25, 26, that um, I just felt like it was eating away at me and I, I needed to learn more. You mentioned your grandfather, your paternal grandparents. Um, they painted a picture of your father that was entirely different from what little you remember. Um, was there ever a point that you doubted their ver I, I, I guess I kept reading the story trying to figure, you're a six year old, you're going to believe what the adults tell you, but your mind is an incredible thing where you remember little flickers of the truth. How were you reconciling that over the years? So I think because I was just so traumatized from the whole thing, I had everything so blocked out that no memories were really coming in at all from my childhood. It was just, I couldn't remember anything. Um, so it really was just something inside of me. I guess you could call it like your intuition. Um, yeah. Later that I was able to kind of like break through the noise and just find out more. And, um, you know, I think a, a lot of what I found out, I don't know if my dad's family even necessarily knew um, about how dark it was. And, and most of what I found out was um, from articles and from um, the journalist that covered the story. So she was really able to provide all these um, pieces of information that my family didn't know. But you actually did discover a box of your mother's letters only about a year ago. And, and in those yeah. letters, which I've looked at, you made another shocking discovery that she wrote that your father, um, the abuse was real and it was also extended to family members, um, including what she wrote about you, which I, I'll let you tell the audience what your mother and her words wrote about you and your father. So, um in March of 1998, my mom predicted her own death. She predicted how she was going to be murdered, everything. And um, in this letter, she wrote that my dad had threatened to kill her. And if she tried to leave with me that night, he was going to hunt and kill both of us um, and the rest of her family members as well. So she said that she therefore sacrificed her life to save mine and the rest of her family's. Um, and seeing that in her handwriting and knowing that he did carry out his threat to kill her, it was just so, I was so taken back because this whole time I thought that my dad loved me and um, never would want to hurt me. So it was really hard for me to process. When your mother wrote that letter, and, and you know my work with domestic violence survivors, that was the most dangerous point of the journey. Um, statistics show that when a person who is being abused is readying to leave, that is when the abuser often strikes the hardest because they have lost control. Your father was sentenced to 15 years. He's been out almost five years, and you've said that you've forgiven him, but you haven't spoken to him since uh, you were just 15. Is there any more to the family secret that you want to know, or do you know all you need at this point in your journey? I mean, I hope I found out everything that there is. I hope there's not even more because it's just been a lot to really process. I kind of had to re-grieve my mom's death. Um, I had no idea the extent of how horrible things were. Um, 
I don't know if there's if there's more information still or um, you know just what was kind of covered during that time period, but um, I never knew about a lot of things with his past before my mom um, about his history of abuse with other women. So that's something that adds more to the story of this didn't just happen to my mom. This happened to his first wife. This happened to employees that he worked with. So he really had wow. a long history abusing women. As you can imagine, it's an incredible journey for her. And reading through news coverage, Sarah kept coming back to one name in particular, Jan Heffler. That was the investigative reporter who covered the case for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And Jan joins us now from Cinnamonson, New Jersey. Um, Jan, thank you so much for joining us. Listen, this case got a lot of coverage, obviously a murder in an affluent suburb. We know all of the things that the media will gravitate to with this story, but there was also something much deeper, which was that child who was in the home. Um, when you started to read the details, what, you're a reporter, you've covered awful things, and we know people do awful things every day. What particularly um, pulled you into the deeper story here? Well, it was several things, the fact that the child was downstairs, heard the shot of, of her mother being killed by her father. That That's very highly unusual and trauma, traumatic and haunting. Um, but beyond that, and then we found as the case proceeded that there was this blackmailing going on, that her husband had videotaped her, ordered her to do sexual deviant acts, videotaped her, and then threatened her if she dared to leave him ever that he would expose those uh, videotapes and provide them to her own parents, um, to a judge if she, in fact, was fighting custody for um, Sarah, and also show them to her boss. And this was way back mm. before the Me Too uh, movement came about. So women at that time were very reluctant and very um, ashamed um, to come forward and to have something like that exposed would have just been too too difficult for her to bear. There have been many stories that I've not been able to shake covering crime. Did you often think about that little girl, whatever happened to her? What is her life like all these years later? Oh, I often did because she was the only person, the only critical person that I was unable to interview. Um, I had talked to all of um, or many of uh, Brenda's colleagues and family members and also talked um, to people who knew the murderer as well, but I didn't know her. She was so um, greatly shielded from the story, and rightly so. Um, but I always wondered how uh, things went for her. You know, which, would it have scarred her for life? Would she have become very timid or angry or bitter or just um, been unable to focus on anything um, worthwhile in, in life? And I just wondered that um, since so, such, so many precautions were taken to shield her from the ugly truths, you know, had that in fact helped. And um, I, after I met her, I, I was convinced that it had. 